Morning, everyone. Um, we have a large number of people uh, joining us this morning, so we were just um, giving people a chance to uh, to log in there. Um, so again, a big welcome to you all, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's great to see so many people logging in. Um, our aim this morning is to provide you with up-to-date and reliable information about e-cigarettes and vaping. We'll be exploring things like who is vaping in Ireland today, what are the harms that might arise from vaping, we look at some pending legislation and regulation and things like that as well. Um, over the course of the next hour and a half, you're going to hear from Martina Blake, who's the national lead for the HSE Tobacco Free Ireland programme. And Martina will speak about the work of the, uh, of the tobacco programme currently as it pertains to um, tobacco and e-cigarettes. You'll hear from Dr. Paul Kavanagh, who's the public health medicine advisor to the Tobacco Free Ireland programme. Paul will speak a little bit about the harms of e-cigarettes and what the evidence says about their safety. Um, and he look at things like, do they help people to quit smoking? And then we'll have a panel discussion where we'll have colleagues from the Environmental Health Service, uh, our Stop Smoking Services, um, the youth work sector, and we'll also have um, a student on the panel as well. Uh, this webinar is being recorded this morning. Um, so for any of you that would like to watch it back or share with your colleagues, friends, family after, you'll be able to do that. And the Q&A is open. I would imagine an awful lot of what you might have to ask us this morning will be addressed through the presentations and the panel discussion, but the Q&A is open for specific questions that you might want to direct to us. So first up, Martina Blake, the National Lead for the HSE Tobacco Free Ireland Programme, is going to speak to you. Martina. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, good morning. So delighted to have so many um, joining us today. Um, and I know there's lots of people that couldn't make it, but will want to look at the, the record afterwards. So um, I lead out on the HSE Tobacco Free Ireland programme. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do in Tobacco Free Ireland um, and uh, our goal for a Tobacco Free Ireland and the challenge that e-cigarette poses to us in achieving that. So our overall aim is to reduce smoking prevalence and reduce the number of people who smoke down to 5%. Um, and we're, we're trying to do that through a number of different measures. So we want to denormalize smoking for the next generation. So we want to make sure that children don't end up picking up smoking as a normal uh, passage and a right uh, into, into adulthood. Um, we want to try and prevent that. Uh, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about how we've done that uh, and how we've reduced smoking prevalence for young people um, over the last number of years. Um, we want to treat tobacco dependence as a disease. A lot of people, even some of our health professionals, have this view that smoking is a bad habit that you can uh, overcome it uh, through willpower alone. But we know uh, the WHO tells us that uh, tobacco addiction is a disease, needs to be treated as such. So we need to use uh, medication and best practice in terms of stop smoking support, professional help to try and quit. In fact, nicotine has been uh, uh, shown to be even more addictive um, than, than heroin. So, so we absolutely need to treat it as a disease and manage it in such a way. We obviously provide uh, stop smoking support and, and we in the programme would coordinate the stop smoking support delivery. We have uh, over 200 staff across the country delivering stop smoking support services and you can get it in a variety of different ways, face to face, online and through groups. Um, and this year we introduced free stop smoking medication. So that's been really, really positive. Um, and uh, we've treated over 18,000 people already this year alone, which is a huge number um, and more than we've ever seen uh, through our services. So that's really, really positive and welcome. Uh, obviously, tobacco-free environments is a really Im important measure as well. We want to try and denormalise. So we want to appeal to the public to respect our policy and not to smoke on HSC grounds um, under health and safety. And obviously, uh, uh, in terms uh, that can be a risk factor for us as well, if they're smoking on healthcare grounds near oxygen and different things like that. And there's been a number of incidents around that. Uh, and we try and promote smoke-free environments external to the HSC through smoke-free parks and playgrounds. And we know that that's really a effective in terms of reducing the amount of smoking that children witness. If we have less places that people can smoke, it's less normalised. So what are e-cigarettes and what's in them? Um, so you'll see uh, on the slide there a number of different types of e-cigarettes. So there's the um, uh, single-use uh, e-cigarettes, which are, are very common and popular among young people. 
Um, you have vape pens and, and the tank type e-cigarettes that can be recharged and refilled. And lots of different flavors and packaging, very attractive um, flavors and packaging. And our colleague, uh, Margaret Ruddy from the Environmental Health Service will be on later on in the Q&A and showing you some of the products that are available. And what's in e-cigarettes? So lots of different particles in, in e-cigarettes. So ultra-fine particles that, come, that get right deep down into the alveoli of the lungs when, when inhaled. Nicotine itself, obviously, which is highly addictive. And what, it, it's what keeps people coming back and vaping uh, again and again. Um, diacetyl and flavorings, which in and of itself, uh, you know, in, in, they're, they're included in food and, and are relatively safe. But when they're heated and inhaled, that can cause a problem for us in terms of um, lung disease. And my colleague, Dr. Paul Kavna, will, will talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, volatile organic compounds, some heavy metals such as nickel and lead, and cancer-causing chemicals. So um, definitely, uh, you know, a, a risk. Um, so there's no benefit for young people in terms of, of e-cigarette juice. So who is vaping? Um, hot off the press, Healthy Ireland study uh, 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 out this morning. Um, so um, we can see that vaping has increased among adults. So it was 3% in 2016 and has risen to 8% um, this year, 2013. Um, obviously high use and rising use again in under 25s, 20% uh, of women and 16% of men vaping. They, they're the new stats out this morning. Um, for young people, we rely on two different studies um, that are kind of, you know, large enough to kind of uh, look at in terms of a national sample. So the Health Behaviour in School Age Children study comes out uh, every four years. And unfortunately, we're just at the end of a four year cycle and we're awaiting new data next year, which will be out early next year. But in the data that we have from 2018, uh, one in 10, 12 to 17 year olds vaping. Um, and SPAD is another study looking at 16 year olds only um, and they found um, one in five 16 year olds or 18 percent around uh, were, were smoking in 2019 which is a rise from what it was in 2015 and we anticipate um, that that's much higher than that um, and we, we those two studies will be will be conducted and be out next year so we'll be able to kind of watch this picture so how are we doing on reducing smoking for children um, so just quoting this SPAD study again, European study on prevention of alcohol and drugs, we've been really successful in reducing teenage smoking um, in Ireland um, and, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, I suppose at the forefront in Europe in terms of reducing adolescent smoking. So 33% in 2003 um, and in 2019 down to 14%. And how did we do it? So in this image, you'll see a picture of some young people in a pub uh, prior to 2004 when you could smoke inside. Um, we managed in 2004 with the groundbreaking legislation, Ireland, the first country in the world to reduce smoking among children. So we moved it outside, denormalized it. And now we have smoking back inside. Um, there's nothing in the legislation to stop uh, people smoking in, indoors, and it's up to each individual premises to make those decisions. So we're normalizing that again, making it, making it, you know, challenge, makes it a challenge for us. Um, history repeating itself uh, up until the 90s, so 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, you could buy a single cigarette. You could go into a shop and buy a single cigarette and kids used to do that. Um, we, we, we moved to, to larger packs, so you can see uh, the, the smallest pack you can get is a 20 pack. This is a 27 uh, pack. Um, and now we have single vapes. So back to kind of easily accessible, cheaper, readily available nicotine that children can, can access. So that's our challenge. This is a slide showing um, packs on display in shops. So historically, we had packs on display advertising just beside everything, beside the milk and the bread in your regular corner shop, um, as if it was just a regular product. This is a product that kills one in every two. So it's not a regular product. It needs to be uh, managed in such a way. So we put it behind closed doors through legislation. That was really positive. But now we're back to e-cigarettes on display again, um, right beside the milk and the bread. Uh, so that's our challenge. The packet itself, the white silk cut, fresh looking packet. This is an image of a packet from a number of years ago before we had pictorial warnings. 
Um, we, we moved to plain packaging, um, so that was really, really positive. The drab green color, big, big warnings, pictorial warnings, um, and uh, the same size font, and kind of taking the tool of the pack itself in terms of a marketing tool away from the industry. But e-cigarettes are marketed in very attractive colors, who wouldn't want to try pineapple ice? You know, I mean, I was actually showing these slides to my daughter, my youngest, who's 11, and she said, Mommy, if I, if I thought that the, if I didn't know these were bad for you, I'd love to try that. Because of course you would love to try it, because, you know, it, it's just very attractive looking uh, for a young person. So how are we doing on uh, reducing smoking prevalence for children? So I showed this earlier. We've, we've been really successful from 2003. The first year that we looked at e-cigarette use, um, SPAD, was in 2015. We had 10% using e-cigarettes of 16-year-olds at that point. In 2019, that had risen to 18%. And we have a, a, a worrying trend in terms of smoking use among children between 2015 and 2019, where it grew by 1%. For boys, which I don't have shown on the slide, it grew up to 16%. So that's why we're concerned. Um, that's why we're, 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 work, we're working in this area. So what are we doing in the health service to respond to this emerging issue? Um, so we've developed clinical guidelines, uh, which were published last year. Um, so that gives guidelines to our health professionals in terms of what's best practice. And within those guidelines, we looked at e-cigarettes and the position we have on those. And my colleague, uh, Paul, will, will talk you through those later on. We've been working with the Department of Education, with schools, and we piloted lessons um, last year. And we now launched uh, five new lesson plans uh, within SPHE Junior Cycle Curriculum uh, on smoking and vaping, and they're on our website to download. Um, we also uh, produced a new animated video. Um, it's part of the SPHE, but is a standalone resource as well. And we'll be playing that for you in a few minutes. Um, and we also revised a program called Quit for Youth, which is a seven week stop smoking program. So now it's a stop smoking and a vaping program. And you can um, access that or find out more information about that from your health promotion colleagues. Today, we're launching a brand new uh, booklet, um, Vaping and E-Cigarettes uh, Information, um, and it's written in a plain English uh, way, um, and that's available on our website, and my colleagues will put that into the chat, the link on where you can access that. We're also launching the Schools Resource um, Information booklet, booklet for Schools, which can be downloaded from our website. So delighted to have those resources. Um, we can see from, uh, you know, Google searches and things that people are looking for information on e-cigarettes. So we updated um, the content on our Quit website around vaping. Um, we also worked with our colleagues in environmental health uh, to put in a joint submission to the consultation on vaping that uh, the Department of Environment and Oshin Smith uh, issued a number of months ago. Um, and, you know, we are seeing a demand for stop vaping support from clients coming to our service. That poses a challenge to us because we're not resourced to deliver a stop vaping support service. But we are trying and uh, endeavouring to try and support uh, young people, adults, anybody who comes to our service uh, as, as much as we can where capacity allows. So... Uh, you will be hearing from uh, my colleague, Dr. Or Margaret Ruddy, later on in terms of envi from environmental health services. They have a role around inspecting e-cigarette legislation and um, tobacco legislation, and they do a minimum of 40 inspections a year, um, inspecting product. And you'll hear from Margaret later that, unfortunately, 90% of the inspections that they've carried out so far this year have, have shown non-compliant product. Uh, but Margaret will talk to you a little bit more about that. So what, what you see and what, what might be said on the tin in terms of what, what's on an e-cigarette product may not be what's in the product. Um, so that's really important information for you to be aware of. Um, we've been working with an uh, organization called Spun Out, which, which is a youth-focused website, which you might be aware of, to review their content. And they'll be launching their new campaign uh, in the next couple of weeks. We've been working with Tusla, Planet Youth in the West, and Planet Youth, um, uh, the North Dublin uh, Drugs Task Force as well, to develop new resources and parent uh, slides and information uh, for their local populations. We're also working on a youth resource for an out-of-school setting on the prevention of vaping. So what are our challenges? Um, so we know what works for stop smoking support. 
we're less certain about what works for um, for vaping for stop vaping support. That's a huge challenge, uh, and we need research uh, into this area to try and and help us understand that a bit more. Uh, so responding to the issue is challenging because uh, there's there's only there isn't enough investment in terms of research. So we, we absolutely need uh, more funding there. We know what the risks of smoking are. Um, and the short-term risks of vaping, but we're learning all the time. And it will, it will probably be a number of decades before we know what the long-term risks of vaping might be. And my colleague Paul will talk a little bit more about, about that. And as I said, we're not resourced to respond to this issue. Um, so we absolutely need uh, further resourcing to be able to respond, to be able to develop a service, to be able to look at what, what might work and best practice in terms of stop vaping support if we need that into the future. So where to next? And who has a role to, pay, to play? This isn't just an issue for the HSE. Um, it's an issue for society as a whole. So our government representatives and our legislators have a role in terms of um, looking at the legislation that's, uh, that's there in terms of um, uh, point of sale, flavours, um, you know, and, and, and sale to minors. And Paul will be talking a little bit more about that. The Department of Health obviously have a play to, uh, role to play. The Department of Education, uh, Department of the Environment, Climate um, and Communications, retailers in terms of being responsible in their serving and responsible in their sales. And obviously young people and parents themselves have a role to play in, in this emerging issue. So just a reminder of what we're launching today. So we're launching these two new resources, which will be on the website uh, for you to download um, on healthpromotion.ie. Um, and we're going to play out the, uh, we'll play the video in a, in a, in a little minute, um, the animated video that we produced this year. And uh, while we're doing that, I'd just like to welcome uh, Dr. Paul Kavanagh to the stage. Paul is a public health doctor, uh, specialist in public health medicine, and he's clinical lead and, and uh, support to us in the Tobacco Free Ireland programme. And he led the development of the clinical guidelines. And Paul is going to talk to you a little bit more about those in a few minutes. So we'll just play the video now. Um, thanks very much. Sometimes people who smoke or vape will say that they are not addicted and that they could quit at any time. But then they don't, despite the fact that they know that what they are doing is harmful to their health. The addictive effects of smoking and vaping are initially hidden and lead a person to believe that they are in control when in fact they are addicted. Tobacco companies spend billions on convincing young people that smoking and vaping is somehow okay, even glamorous. For instance, they pay celebrities and influencers to promote their products on social media and pay production companies to place their products in films and on TV, all to get young people addicted and increase their profits. Nicotine is the psychoactive drug responsible for the addictive effects of tobacco and e-cigarette products. Even smoking a small number of cigarettes or just a short time spent experimenting with e-cigarettes can cause a person to become addicted. Once in the body, nicotine is fast and sneaky. It races into the lungs when you smoke or vape. From the lungs, it enters the blood and reaches the brain within seconds of that first puff. Nicotine affects a pathway in the brain called the reward pathway. The reward pathway is the area of the brain which makes us feel good every time we eat something that tastes nice or do something that we enjoy. Once nicotine arrives at this area of the brain, it attaches itself to receptors like a key fitting in a lock. This activates the reward pathway. When the pathway is activated, a chemical called dopamine is released. Dopamine is the feel-good hormone and creates feelings of pleasure. Repeated stimulation of the reward pathway with nicotine results in a rewiring of the reward pathway as your brain becomes convinced that it needs nicotine to release dopamine to make you feel good. Every time you smoke or vape, you get that feeling of reward, so you do it again and again. Over time, the body becomes convinced that it needs nicotine to feel good, but it can never get enough. Nicotine can trigger brain changes that make people, particularly young people, crave more nicotine. Until about age 25, the brain is still developing and using nicotine can harm the parts of the brain that control attention, learning, mood and impulse control. 
Nicotine also has physical effects on the body. People who smoke or vape may experience any combination of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cold clammy skin, a rapid pulse, dizziness, fainting. The longer you smoke or vape, the stronger the cravings for nicotine become. When you quit smoking or vaping, the reward pathway is not stimulated by nicotine anymore, resulting in less dopamine. With less dopamine, people get withdrawal symptoms. Common symptoms of nicotine withdrawal include anger, frustration and irritability, difficulty concentrating and studying, restlessness and anxiety, difficulty sleeping, depression, hunger or increased appetite. The good news is that these changes in the brain start returning to normal the longer you go without nicotine. Getting past the first stages of withdrawal when you quit can be hard, but over time your brain rewires itself again. It stops craving nicotine and goes back to the way it was before you smoked or vaped. It is normal for young people to want to experiment as they grow into adulthood, but nicotine addiction happens very quickly and the risk of long-term addiction is very high. There is no upside to smoking or using e-cigarettes at all. The HSE has services that can help you to stop smoking or vaping. Gina, so I'm Dr. Paul Kavanagh and I'm Public Health Advisor to the HSE Tobacco Free Ireland Programme. You're all very welcome here this morning and the next 20 minutes or so I'm going to touch off a number of points. So I'm going to reflect a little bit on the big picture and talk about the continuing a huge scale of harm caused by smoking. I'm going to talk about the harms of e-cigarettes, um, reflect on what the evidence tells us. I'm then going to address these questions. Are e-cigarettes safe and should it be used as a way to help people stop smoking? And finally then I'm um, I'm going to talk about what we're currently doing and what we're going to do next. So starting off first then in terms of the big picture and the big scale of harm that's caused by smoking here in Ireland. So these pictures here look, um, I think if we look back a generation ago, we can think about people smoking in pubs, people smoking in the workplace, in offices at their desks, people smoking on the bus. Uh, we look back and we think, goodness me, what were we doing? All of that seems absolutely difficult to understand in terms of the huge change that has been in Ireland in terms of our collective attitudes towards smoking. And we know that through political leadership and public support, uh, we've been successful in implementing a number of big, bold measures here in Ireland that have led to huge reductions in smoking and critically this culture change, this denormalisation of smoking, uh, which has brought us to a point where smoking prevalence has reduced in the population. And back in 2013, um, our government set the bold ambition that it would create a tobacco-free Ireland for the next generation. Now, um, unfortunately, our job is not done. So despite progress, each week in Ireland, there are almost 100 people who die from smoking-related harm. That's 100 deaths that are absolutely avoidable. And just to put a picture on that in terms of that scale of harm, that would be um, 100 people fit on a Dublin bus. So this is the scale of harm in terms of preventable deaths that are caused by smoking each week in Ireland. Very conscious then from a health service perspective, we're heading into the winter period, which is a period of big challenges in terms of high demand for our health services. Again, each week in Ireland, we have a thousand hospitalizations, a thousand people come to our health service each week in Ireland because they need to be treated for disease that has been caused by smoking. And again, just to put a picture on that, um, each week in Ireland, um, about 10% um, uh, of our hospital capacity um, has been used by people who have smoking related disease. Um, so again, um, you, just to put a picture on that for you, that's the equivalent of um, a hospital like um, the, uh, University Hospital Limerick in the Midwest or St. and St. Vincent's in Dublin that are full each day uh, because they're treating people that have smoking related harm. So there's still a huge scale of harm uh, each week in Ireland that's caused by smoking and that's completely uh, avoidable. Um, in terms of uh, the progress that we made, uh, we have seen good progress in terms of reducing smoking prevalence across the population. So at the end of the last century, about one in three people smoked in Ireland, and that's now down to one in five. But what's a little bit concerning for us is that we have seen a stalling in that reduction in smoking prevalence in Ireland. So since COVID, uh, smoking prevalence has been stalled um, at 18%, and it's even more worrying 
when we see announced this morning from the most recent Healthy Ireland survey that smoking prevalence remains stalled um, at 18%. So that's very concerning. Um, we're, we're, we think about smoking, we think about the harm caused to the population in general, but we have to remind ourselves that that burden of smoking-related harm is unfairly and unevenly distributed across the population in Ireland. So we know that there's huge differences across population groups in Ireland, that there's huge variation in terms of the social conditions in which people live their lives. And um, that difference ex uh, in experience in terms of social disadvantage translate through then in terms of poorer health being experienced by people who experience greater social disadvantage. So this is data from our recent um, uh, CSO-led census, and it underlines the fact that uh, the likelihood of somebody reporting that they experience very good or excellent health is much greater among people who are in higher social groups indexed in terms of their um, occupational group than it is among people who are in unskilled or semi-skilled uh, population groups. So there's a huge variation in terms of the opportunity to experience good health, and that depends on the level of social disadvantage that somebody is experiencing. The same is true then when we look at smoking. So smoking is very socially patterned in Ireland. So smoking is much more common um, among poorer groups. And not only is it more common, but as you can see from this figure here, the rate of reduction in smoking prevalence is much slower among poorer groups. So uh, people who are, are in more affluent groups and experience greater social advantage, they have experienced much faster reductions and now have lower smoking prevalence than people that are in our poorer groups. So there's a real risk that we are leaving groups behind as we move towards a tobacco-free Ireland. And um, this difference in terms of uh, smoking prevalence across population groups, because it's such a significant cause of ill health and disease, um, it's estimated about 50% of the health gap um, across social groups um, in Ireland and other developed countries is explained because of differences in smoking prevalence. So if we want to address the differences in health across our social groups in Ireland, we really need to focus in on smoking. So, um, I mean, this, this brings us to this point here, which is, as I said, back in 2013, buoyed up by the great progress that we had made um, in terms of reducing smoking prevalence across the population. Um, in 2013, our government made a commitment towards delivering a tobacco-free Ireland by 2025. Given where we are at the moment with the stalled smoking prevalence, 18% we heard this morning, one in five people still smoking, and, and given the wide variation that there is in smoking prevalence across population groups, we are not going to deliver on this promise. We're not going to achieve our target of a tobacco-free Ireland by 2025. And I'm going to come back and, and, and speak about that uh, challenge at the very end of my talk. So moving on then in terms of the harms of e-cigarettes and what does the evidence say? Well, there have been a number of large reviews conducted in Ireland uh, by our colleagues at the Health Research Board, but also uh, conducted by a number of other expert groups. I'm showing here a picture from the US Surgeon General's report on e-cigarettes. There have been similar reports published by the Scientific Advisory Group to the European Commission and also by expert groups in places like um, Australia as well. And there's broad consensus across all of those groups in terms of what the evidence says around the harms caused by cigarettes. So um, the use of e-cigarettes leads to nicotine dependence. There is early evidence of harm to heart and circulatory system. There is early evidence of harm to lungs and exacerbations of pr problems uh, affecting the lungs like asthma. And that's a problem that's particularly uh, a challenge for children and young people. So there is evidence that e-cigarettes exacerbates problems like asthma. Uh, when we look at the vapour, when we look at the chemicals in e-cigarettes, uh, we do find that they contain uh, chemicals that cause cancer. And then the devices themselves as well can be associated with injuries and harm. So as I say, there is broad consensus across a number of expert reviews underlying the harm that is associated with e-cigarettes. Um, in terms of th that issue around nicotine dependence and going back to the points that I made uh, at the start of the talk in terms of the background challenge here around smoking in the population, our colleagues at the Health Research Board also looked at studies which examined that question as to whether or not for children and young people who don't smoke, if they start using e-cigarettes, are they more likely to go on and start smoking? And what they found was, um, across a number of, of different studies that have been conducted that were well designed when they reanalyzed those studies, what they found was that children and young people who do not smoke, 
if they start using an e-cigarette, they are three to five times more likely to start smoking. And I've already reflected on the devastating harm that's associated with smoking. So that's something that we want to protect children and young people for, for, from in terms of their future health. So I, I, I think this slide summarises the point that I've been trying to make very, very well. I think there is a common misperception that the vapour that's emitted by e-cigarettes is a harmless water vapour. It's not. Um, e-cigarettes very certainly are associated with harm and the vapour that is emitted from an e-cigarette releases a number of chemicals that are associated with harm as well. And I think it's very important in terms of where we are at the moment in relation to our understanding around the harms that are caused by e-cigarettes to remind ourselves that in the middle of the last century, in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, doctors would have stood up and they would have taught, talked about the health benefits of smoking. Like it, it took us decades in terms of scientific research to fully understand the devastating harm that's caused by smoking. And I would remind us that we're at a very early stage in terms of our understanding around the harms that are caused by e-cigarettes. And I think we need to watch this space and evidence will continue to unfold in terms of what that picture is telling us. I think we also have to remind ourselves who is behind the e-cigarettes. So there's a number of different stories in terms of how e-cigarettes came about. And one of the stories is that e-cigarette, the first e-cigarette was invented by a pharmacist working in China whose father smoked very heavily and he was very worried about that and he produced this, this e-cigarette to try and address that problem. And in the early stages of the production of e-cigarettes, uh, these products were produced by very small and independent um, manufacturers. But increasingly we understand that the e-cigarette has been taken over by and is increasingly owned by the tobacco industry. So uh, we have companies like Imperial Brands, Philip Morris, British America Tobacco, Japan Tobacco International, who have all bought out the companies that produce um, e-cigarettes. So they are controlling the market um, and controlling the narrative when it comes to um, e-cigarettes globally. And I, I think we just need to look at uh, Juul in the US which was bought out by Altria, uh, which is a big uh, tobacco company, one of the biggest tobacco companies um, in America, to see what the impact is then in terms of the uh, marketing and the promotion um, of those products um, and the issues that that has then in terms of children and young people and the use of e-cigarettes. So we're all aware that um, there have been a number of um, cases that have been settled by Juul uh, that were taken against them in terms of their contribution to the uh, epidemic, as the US Surgeon General has referred to it, um, of e-cigarette use among children and young people in the US. Uh, so once the tobacco industry becomes involved in the production and marketing of e-cigarettes, we very much see the uh, what we call the industry playbook played out in terms of the promotion marketing of these products to vulnerable children and young people, and then the use of tactics like denial, confusion, um, in terms of interrupting um, any measures that there may be put in place to try and counter uh, their, 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 their effects on the use of their product um, among children and young people. So uh, moving on to these questions then, are e-cigarettes safe and should they be used um, to help uh, people quit smoking? Well, I, I have addressed this a little bit already um, in the preceding slides where I talked about a number of the big studies uh, where there's broad consensus in relation to the harms that are associated with e-cigarettes. So on the left here, we can see um, a figure which is illustrating a number of the chemicals that are, are emitted when um, tobacco is burned. So predominant among those is tar, for example. So there's a number of different chemicals that are produced and they are all very harmful to health. When we look at the vapour that's emitted from an e-cigarette, we also identify a number of uh, chemicals um, that are harmful to health. Uh, so we identify things like um, ultrafine particles, uh, volatile organic compounds, some cancer-causing chemicals, heavy metals as well, uh, the flavourings themselves that you know, have been predominantly designed as food additives are now being uh, heated in a way that they weren't designed to be and inhaled, and of course nicotine itself. So we know that the uh, chemical composition of e-cigarette vapour also includes a number of chemicals which are harmful to health. Now, we do, we do understand that there are some um, chemicals, in particular tar, that is emitted when people burn tobacco that we don't find in e-cigarettes. And then some of these other chemicals are found in lower concentrations. 
But, you know, we have to step back and ask ourselves, is this comparison between um, the smoke that's emitted when somebody burns tobacco and the vapour that's emitted when somebody um, turns on an e-cigarette, is that a fair comparison? I mean, we're talking about a product, uh, when we talk about uh, tobacco products, that when it's used um, on an ongoing basis by people, um, that results in, on average, people losing 10 years of life. People who use tobacco products on a continuing basis, um, on average, one in two people will die from smoking-related disease. So it's very hard for us to conceive a product that could be any more dangerous than uh, tobacco products. So I think holding that up as a benchmark and saying, well, look, we have a product which is safer than that is not a fair comparison. Uh, you know, this is a, the, the, the comparison in terms of um, a product, um, tobacco products. These are products that are devastating in terms of their harm to health and they would never be allowed on the market today. Uh, so I think we do have to ask that question, is that comparison fair? And the other thing that we need to reflect on is, particularly in terms of our conversation this morning, which is about protecting children and young people from the harms of e-cigarettes, uh, these are people that we do not want to see smoking. And these are people who are not smoking and instead are starting to use um, e-cigarettes. So, you know, the proposition there or this comparison in terms of, well, this is something that is maybe safer than e-cigarettes, uh, than, 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 than burning tobacco when it comes to e-cigarettes, does not stack up because we're talking about protecting children and young people who we do not want to see smoking in the first instance. Then in terms of this question as to whether or not e-cigarettes should be used as a way to help people stop smoking. Uh, this is a question that we examined um, in the production of a national clinical guideline uh, to support our stop smoking services, which was reviewed by the National Clinical Effectiveness Committee in the Department of Health and uh, mandated by a Minister for Health um, in 2022 and was published. So we looked at a range of different interventions that may help people stop smoking. We looked at behavioural support or counselling. We looked at a range of different stop smoking medicines. And we also looked at e-cigarettes. And it, for all of those different interventions, we ask three simple questions. Does the intervention work? Is it safe? And are there wider considerations? Uh, and when we examined the evidence at the time um, in relation to e-cigarettes, uh, we were um, not happy that the evidence stocked up um, in terms of it being certain and consistent that e-cigarettes were helpful in terms of helping people stop smoking. Uh, we had significant concerns when it came to the safety profile of these products, particularly in a context when compared to other stop smoking medicines like nicotine replacement therapy, these are not licensed medicines. So these have not been benefited from all the checks and balances that are in place through our Health Products Regulatory Agency when it comes to uh, licensed medicines. And then in particular, when it comes to wider considerations, um, uh, the guideline group was very aware that in Ireland, um, we have a concern in terms of rising e-cigarette use among children and young people. And uh, we, did, we do not, at this point in time, have adequate protections in place um, in terms of protecting children and young people from the use of e-cigarettes. We know that in our Tobacco Free Ireland policy document, there is appropriately, something we'd all agree with, a very big focus on protection, and young, uh, protection of children and young people from the harms of smoking. So from our perspective, in terms of those wider considerations, we, 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 um, when we couple that with our evidence in terms of whether or not e-cigarettes work to help people stop smoking, and then these wider safety concerns, uh, we did not make a recommendation that e-cigarettes should be used as a way to help people stop smoking. But of course, there are a wide range of other supports that are available, many of which now are free through HSE services and are available through quit.ie. So finally then, what are we doing and what are we doing next? Um, so I'm, I'm just going to repeat um, and reflect on some of the points that Martina made already um, in terms of the work that's happening around the challenge of, of e-cigarettes. So uh, it's very, very um, welcome that um, our Minister for Health has been successful um, to date in bringing uh, forward legislation, uh, the uh, Public Health Tobacco Products and Nicotine Inhaling Bill, um, uh, which will put in place measures to protect the population uh, and particularly protect children and young people when it comes to the harms of um, e-cigarettes. So we know that that legislation has come, go, gone through um, our, 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 our doll and is currently with our Shannon in terms of further review, and we hope that that will be in place before the end of the year. Uh, we know that that will put in place measures uh, to provide for licensing of retailers that sell tobacco and nicotine inhaling products or e-cigarettes. So that's very important. And I know my colleague Margaret from Environmental Health will, will say a little bit about this uh, shortly. Um, it also prohibits the sale of tobacco and e-cigarette products to children and young people. 
Um, it prohibits the sale of um, e-cigarettes at children's events, and it also prohibits advertising um, of e-cigarettes in certain places and in, cigarette, and in cinemas, so that's good. Uh, what it won't do, however, is um, it won't control the content of e-cigarettes, including things like flavours. Um, it won't put any controls in place in terms of packaging and naming of e-cigarette uh, products. And Martina illustrated just how those uh, products are marketed at the moment. And it won't put in place um, any controls in terms of point of say, sale display of e-cigarette products. And the fact that that picture that we have um, that we, that we said goodbye to uh, behind the counter at the news agent of all of the different tobacco products has now been replaced by a new picture, which is all the different e-cigarette products. So it won't put in place a control in terms of that. So um, in terms of what we're doing and, and what we think the next options are, um, definitely within the HSE, once the uh, nicotine uh, and, and uh, sorry, the tobacco and nicotine inhaling products bill has been enacted, our colleagues in environmental health services will be taking forward the implementation and enforcement of those provisions. We continue to develop and share information, education programs and resources. That's what we're doing with you today. Um, from our point of view, we have already sought been unsuccessful, but we will continue to seek funding for mass media campaigns similar to that which they put in place in other jurisdictions that focuses in um, on informing the public um, around the harms of e-cigarettes. And we will continue to seek funding, which again we were unsuccessful with, but we will continue to seek um, in relation to developing services to help people stop vaping. In terms of the future, um, definitely there's um, scope for more monitoring and more research to better understand the problem as it evolves in terms of e-cigarettes across the population here in Ireland. We'll continue to work at an international level with our colleagues at the EU in terms of their revision of the Tobacco Products Directive, which is a very important regulatory framework to, which includes regulation of e-cigarettes. So we want to make sure that that's right and then that will get um, translated into provisions here in Ireland. Uh, we think that there is a need and, and we welcome um, uh, an understanding that we have that the Minister will be consulting on this shortly. There's definitely a need to review local legislation to see does it address gaps around things like flavours, packaging, point of sale display as well. Uh, we need to monitor global approaches, uh, understand what's happening there and what may be applicable in Ireland. So in particular, for example, people will be aware that in Australia they have announced that they will make e-cigarettes available through pharmacies. So they're very much uh, regulating the product as a medicinal product. So that's something that we're interested in learning more about. And finally then, uh, we think there is an urgent need to review tobacco-free Ireland policy and bring forward a new tobacco end game. And just to take that and, and sort of to finish this off now and, and over, hand over to our colleagues on the panel, um, I think in the last week or so, we were all really pleased to hear the news um, that Ireland has announced a roadmap to eliminate cervical cancer by 2040. So it's only 2010, I think it was, that we actually implemented the rollout of a HPV vaccination programme here in Ireland. So just to pause and think for a moment, you know, that we have gone in a number of decades from rolling out HPV to now announcing our commitment to an ambition that we're going to eliminate cervical cancer in Ireland. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a phenomenal uh, kind of public health achievement to be committed to. Well, let's remind ourselves that there was political commitment in 2013 to a tobacco-free Ireland, that there will be a prevalence of smoking less than 5% by 2025. And here we are in 2023, and we're hearing in terms of the most recent Healthy Ireland survey, that um, it's not that smoking prevalence is steady in the population and that somehow that's an achievement. Actually, there's failure. Uh, tobacco prevalence um, across the population um, has stalled. We're not seeing reductions in smoking prevalence and we're not going to achieve that ambition that we have committed to of delivering a, a tobacco-free Ireland by 2025. And what does that mean um, in terms of um, cancer? So thinking about the example that I talked about in terms of our commitment to eliminate cervical cancer. Well, if we achieve a tobacco-free Ireland, we could eliminate 3,000 cancers each year in Ireland. Three out of four lung cancer cases would disappear. Two out of three cases of cancer of the voice box would disappear in Ireland. One in two cases of bladder cancer would disappear in Ireland if we had a tobacco-free Ireland. 
Uh, we know that this is something the public support. We went out and we asked the public their view in terms of achieving a tobacco-free Ireland and phasing out the sale of tobacco products. Um, and eight out of 10 people told us that's something that they support. There was majority support for tobacco-free Ireland among people who smoke in Ireland. So I suppose as we're here today and we're reflecting on what we can do in terms of uh, building the best possible future for our children and young people when it comes to their health, and we're here thinking about how we can pr protect them from the harms caused by uh, e-cigarettes, very important that we also remember we need to deliver this political commitment to a tobacco-free Ireland and to creating a future for children and young people where they're also protected from the devastating harm caused by tobacco products. Thanks a million, Paul. Um, we're going to have a panel discussion now, um, and uh, Paul is going to join us. Um, no rest today, Paul. Uh, next to Paul, we have um, Margaret Ruddy, who is a Principal Environmental Health Officer with the HSE, and Margaret is the head of the National Tobacco Control Office. Um, Sean Cullen is a transition year student who has kindly agreed to join us this morning to give his perspective. Next to Sean is Amanda Cullen, who works for Feroiga and is an early intervention youth worker. And then next to me is Susan McNicholas, who's one of our own HSC Stop Smoking Advisors. Susan works in the North Dublin area, primarily out of the Grange Gorman Primary Care Centre. So we've heard, Paul, you've spoken a bit about um, legislation and regulation. So I might start with Margaret, um, whose area of expertise this would be. Um, so what regulations are currently in place for e-cigarettes in Ireland, Margaret? Um, Ed, as Paula Martina did say, there is legislation in place um, to cover electronic cigarettes, but we have to bear in mind that that is the minimum safety and quality standards that that legislation is setting. So, for example, we um, have within that legislation the requirement for electronic cigarettes to carry a warning on the packet, um, and that warning is that the product does contain nicotine, which is a highly addictive um, substance. So you can see there in the slides um, that warning is there. You can also see it um, and this is a sample of a product that we would have taken during inspections. So that's how the warning is displayed. Um, the nicotine that's contained within the substances, there is a limit set in the legislation. The limit is 20 milligrams per milliliter or 2%, and that's how it's declared on the package. So there is a legal requirement that that has to be declared. There's also a legal requirement within the legislation of the nicotine containing liquid within the product cannot exceed 2 milligrams or 2 milliliters. Um, but we are seeing that this is increasingly being um, exceeded by the products on the market. There is no requirement on the packaging to declare the volume, the two mils, but you would see it around puffs. Puffs sometimes be declared on the packet, and that can either be um, displayed as six to 800 puffs, which indicates that the product meets the two mil requirement. Or again, we're increasingly seeing products with thousands of puffs. You can see in the slides, we have products there with 9,000, 10,000, um, even products that are labeled with 14 mil. That those slides give examples of products that the team would have come across when they were out doing um, their, their retail inspections. Um, so as Paul and Martina again were saying through their slides, that legislation is enforced by the National Environmental Health Service. We do that through um, each year implementing a programme of planned targeted inspections. And we also sample these products at retail um, levels. So we are taking the products, we're sending them off for analysis for nicotine and um, nicotine and volume currently, but we are working with the laboratories to, as Paul had said, we are aware that there are other chemicals within these products. So we are, the HSC Environmental Health is working with um, the labs to expand the range of um, of chemicals that we're testing for as well. Um, so that's the right. Back in a second and look at what happens when something is found to be non-compliant after lab testing. But just to go specifically to legislation, what are the current gaps in our legislation as it pertains to e-cigarettes? Um, currently, as Paul had said, there is no um, age limit on which these products can be sold. They can be sold to under 18 year olds. That's not against the law. And also, Unlike the tobacco products, the cigarettes and the rolling papers, where those retailers have to register with the HSE, um, there is no, there's no requirement for retailers of electronic cigarettes to um, currently register with us. But hopefully, as Paul said in the new legislation, that will um, come into place and it will be our sales and environmental health that will be operating that licensing system and enforcing it. And when the ban comes in to underage sales, 
we will be implementing a test purchase program similar to that that we currently do for the conventional cigarette products. So that's that's the start of the legislation. And then any additional powers that are brought in, it will be environmental health that's enforcing them. Within the current legislation, we do have enforcement powers. Um, when the teams are doing inspections and they come across non-compliant products, we do have the power to seize, remove those, detain those products and order their destruction. Or if they're not destroyed by the retailer, we bring them into HSE um, control and we destroy them. This year alone, we have um, destroyed thousands of non-compliant products out there. And we're also working with Customs and Revenue and our colleagues in environmental health at the port to stop products coming in through the ports onto the market because the market is, there is a lot of non-compliant product out there. And just the message is, because the product is sitting on a shelf, it doesn't mean that it complies with the regulations that are in place. It's to be aware that it's really buyer beware because there are products, as the team are seeing, are highly, highly non-compliant as well. And there is a public alert that gets issued when something is found to be non-compliant and you know, it's called, uh, called a RAPEX alert. I know a lot of people on the call this morning won't know what that is. Do you want to maybe um, let them know about it? That is a European-wide notice because obviously Ireland was within Europe. So once a product is on our market, it can also, you know, once it gets into our market cleared at the ports, it also can be um, for sale throughout the European market. So once the team are out, they do inspections and they see that a product doesn't comply with the legislation or through our sampling programs where we test for the nicotine and we see that a product has higher levels of nicotine, those products are deemed to be dangerous, high risk and we issue these European-wide notices, which means that they go on the European Safety Gate. We notify our co other colleagues in Europe, and we also issue um, public alert notices to notify the Irish public. And you can, uh, there's a few there. Um, Ed, if you want to show the slide, I think it's the third slide, just to give the audience an indication yeah. of what these public alert notices look like. Um, it's not coming up, but basically when we do alert, issue these RepEx alerts, we send them to the premises that we know are retailing the products. They display them in their shops. And we also put them up on the HSE website. If you go on, that's an example there, Ed, on the third, the next slide. Yeah. That's an example of the public alert notices that we do display on the HSE tobacco control webpage. Um, and if the general public want to log in there, they can go into the tobacco compliance and enforcement page on the HSE and they will see the, the alerts. We have issued five this year. And they all came about because when we go out, as I say, it's beware. Just because it says 20 milligrams per milliliter or 2% on the package, when we sampled those products, we found that they had nicotine concentrations much higher than the legal. We had ones coming back up to 29 milligrams per milliliter. And again, it's to bear in mind, nicotine is addictive. Um, and at those concentrations, those products were deemed to be serious, um, present a serious risk to the public. So that's why we initiated the red picks. And... Um, new and emerging products, Margaret, is that something that you guys are watching in the Environmental Health Service as well? We do. We always keep an eye out when we're doing inspections and we increasingly are seeing nicotine pouches that um, are coming on the market and you will see them in the shops sitting on the shelf um, beside the, the electronic cigarettes. Again, those products do contain nicotine, but unfortunately they don't. the current legislation that covers tobacco products and electronic cigarettes does not cover those nicotine pouches. So that's a gap again in the legislation and it's new products um, that are out there that aren't being regulated by ourselves. Okay, so just something else uh, to be aware of that we do need to be vigilant in the wider tobacco and nicotine control community almost to keep an eye out for these new and emerging products. Um, Sean, we might come to you next. Thanks very much for, uh, I'd say, broke your heart this morning and get out of school for an hour to come in to us. Oh, but uh, yeah. thanks a million. Um, now, I know when we were chatting before, um, you're a transition year student and you have tried e-cigarettes. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe say what made you try them and just, how you found it? I don't know, just everyone was trying them and I just thought I'd give it a shot. Like, yeah. And how did, how, how did you find it? Like, was it, what, was it flavours that attracted you yeah, to no, it, it just, or the smell? It's just everyone around me was doing it. And it was just, I kind of felt like a bit of the odd one out. So I just said, I just asked, asked for a shot of it. Okay. And it was just the flavours, really, like the smell of it as well. Yeah. It was like real strong. 
And um, how long did you use them for? Was it, for it was only a only a few weeks on and off? Okay. And you, you, I gather from what you're saying that you're not using them anymore. No, no, I'm not using them. I haven't used them in a while. What made you stop? It's just at first they're kind of expensive, and when you use them enough, you kind of start. You want to buy your own ones, but I didn't really have the money to be buying my own ones. Okay. And, uh, it's just I knew it wasn't good for me. Yeah. So I tried to like just cut it off before I ended up getting proper addicted to it. Yeah. Um, speaking about cost, and this is something that we'd ask ourselves in the team because we, we just don't know. So I know they're about eight euros to buy a disposable one. How long would that generally last someone? Depends on how much you need them, how much you want to use them. Yeah. Some people it'll only last you a few hours. Okay. Some people it might last you a week. Okay. So somebody who might be heavily addicted to an e-cigarette might be using two of them a day? Maybe, yeah. Okay, so that can, at eight euros a pop, that can start to add up, add yeah. up in the pocket if you're 15 or 16. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of like your, your age group and just in general what you see happening around you, and we've heard about prevalence this morning and, you know, estimating about 16% of 16-year-olds or something like that are using e-cigarettes. Does that seem accurate to you no, or what do you not think? Not at all. I think it's about be more like 60%. Maybe really? Even more. Really? Yeah. It's way, way more than 16% of people my age, I'd say, are using them way more. So you're seeing it widespread, yeah. like in your yeah. general, general community, in your yeah. age group. And what do you see or what do you think is, is happening to young people who are getting addicted to just, vaping? How is it changing their, their behavior? And, it doesn't really change their behavior, but you can kind of tell when they don't have one on them. Like they kind of start to get a bit more, they're more like touchy, like they're more sensitive. Yeah. Because they're just, they need nicotine. Mm. And obviously um, nicotine withdrawal and things then, I know when we were speaking yeah. before you spoke about people sending texts in the middle of the night looking for a friend to drop over e-liquid, is that happening as well? Sometimes, yeah. The odd yeah. time it'll happen, but that's only people who are really, really, really into it. Yeah. Well, fair play to you for stopping using them. Um, what do you think like protects young people from using e-cigarettes? Is it getting involved in sport or? Um... I think it's just down to their own personal decision not to use them because there's yeah. a lot of there's not a lot that's out there like to stop people from using them. Like it's easy to go into a shop and buy one. It's easy to just get one off your mate. Like, yeah. So there's not. It's kind of just down to whether or not they are interested in using them. And people know they're bad for them, but it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Amanda, we spoke in a public forum in the Aviva at a conference about 18 months ago and you kind of rang an alarm bell then about you were seeing um, more and more young people starting to use e-cigarettes. Um, has that changed in the last 18 months? Is it better, worse? What are you seeing happening on the ground? Um, to be honest, it's, um, it's actually getting worse. And even though as we spoke 18 months ago, I was seeing... Um, like, children as young as eight picking up um, vapes or getting older siblings vapes. And now not only in that cohort is their use increasing, is their actual use increasing, but I'm even seeing and hearing anecdotal stories of five and six year olds picking the blue ras or the, the pineapple version or whatever it is that they're using. So it's, it's that taste, it's the smell, mm -hmm. it's the fact that they see older, older peers, older siblings doing it. Um, and now when I speak of that demographic, I work in um, an area, going back to Paul's uh, presentation, in that low socioeconomic area where like, there is more of a normalcy around vaping and smoking. But like, see the likes of the 16%, I, like, I work with 45 young people and of the 45 young people, there's at least two members of the family that are like vaping and smoking in some cases. Mm. And it's it's now going like across the river. So like where I'm from, like as a mother, I see like that there is like just people in my own area. I know of like the schools in my own area where they're now having to search school bags. They're having to shut toilets down. They're having to fit um, vape sensitive alarms. Um, so like when I would have spoke back then kind of saying like, like just to be where it is increasing. But it's now at a stage where um, I spoke to a couple of my young people in in advance of this and on my project. And they were saying that it's, they actually said to me, it's the way smoking was. Um, 
um, years ago before we knew it was bad. So there's like just an acceptance around smoke, around vaping in particular. And uh, it's kind of, it's better, like I'm using their words, it's better than smoking because at least you don't have the smell of tobacco off you. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's something that kind of, um, that I think of when I even hear vaping, it, it doesn't even really describe what it is because it's not a vapor, it's an aerosol. And yeah. there is a difference. There's, you know, there's particulate matter in an aerosol um, and you are inhaling that into your lungs. Um, solutions, Amanda? Anything? Um, um, I think we need, need to, um, I, it was great to see like kind of Martina slides back because a lot of the stuff that she was talking about is actually kind of the solutions that I was considering myself, particularly around making parents aware of themselves. Because I know of parents who would say, oh no, but it's okay. Because if, if you couldn't vape, it'd be illegal. But then I would try and argue, well, it's only not illegal because we don't know enough about it yet. Mm. And I think we need an equitable rather than an equal solution because different people in different societies are coming from different places. So if you're from a socio, a poor socioeconomic background or you're um, an immigrant who you've come from a country where smoking is like smoking is acceptable and you may not have the literacy or you may not have the access to technology. So we could have all of the stuff on websites that we need and have forms. But if someone has very little English or even very little of their own language, I don't know how you can target these people because I think these are the people who in 20 or 30 years, we're going to be looking at statistics for them. So I don't know, like, I, I don't know how that can be achieved, um, but best luck to people to try and do it. I think policy, I think the legislation is really, really important. I think we need to be more aware that when we have surveys such as Planet Youth, Planet Youth um, went in and spoke to children who were all say, kind of, I'm going to say TY. But if you're not into school, you're going to not be in TY, you're not going to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't, if you're in youth reach or you're not in school or you're doing an apprenticeship, those voices I think are missed as well. So I think we need to kind of think bigger and remember that like the different people who are trying to target have different needs that we may not be quite getting at at the moment. Okay. And from from a, um, uh, a legislative point of view, do you think things like uh, flavour restriction or flavour bans or um, banning disposable vapes, do you think that would help in the in the interim to start to bring the, I think the banning, investigation yeah. down? Yeah, I think banning disposable vapes definitely, and I definitely, definitely think about the flavours because it's the flavour, it's the smell of raspberry. Even if you go into a toilet, like you come out, it's very, very distinct, but it's also very, very enticing. Mm. So even though I have um, no interest in vaping, but you would go, oh, that's blue raspberry or this is this. But if it was like, if it take like on one hand, if you have young people saying that they, they vape because they don't like to smell of tobacco, well then to get them to stop vaping, maybe make the vape smell of tobacco. Yeah. Or maybe leave a residue or or some sort of something it be, would be what I would suggest. But also penalise shops really genuinely because now we have parents who are bringing their children in and saying, do you know what, it's okay that they're allowed vape. So there needs to be a penalty or like places where we used to when you were smoking, if there was a ban, if people knew that there was going to be a proper, proper like people coming in and hitting people where it hurts in their pocket, you can be sure that they're not going to let them like, it's, it's like you get kind of a wrap on the wrist. But if it's a school, I'm only just saying a school because I know there's an issue in schools. But if a school was going to get actually, like, fined yeah. for children vaping, yeah, I would imagine it would go down. But it's all one good for me to sit here and say that like that. I don't have to uh, police it, so. <laughs> and I, I know you wanted to mention um, the potential for using um, vaping devices um, to use other drugs as well. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, so what is starting to happen is um, I am starting to anecdotally hear stories of um, particularly not the the disposable ones, so not the the kind of the little... But the refillable that, cartridges. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's the actual, the refillable ones, but people are using THC in these. Mm. So young people are now getting THC cartridges and putting them in this, but a lot of the time they still smell like vape. So they still may smell like blueberry or they still smell like what, whatever it is. So... It, it means then that like parents who are allowing, like with no judgment, but parents who are allowing their children to vape, you don't know they could be ex like experimenting with THC. However, the scary part of it is, is that we don't know what is in the THC that our young people are buying. And there are stories that there's links to that it's it's what's called spice. So spice is a synthetic, um, it's a synthetic THC. So it could have, there's like, you could have fentanyl, opiates in it, 
Um, it's making young people way more addicted to this THC, whereas young people are, um, they're actually getting really severe withdrawal symptoms um, when they're not getting the THC. You have then that they're exploring, their, um, they're being more violent at home. So I think it's something that we really need to be mindful of yeah. um, because it, this is something that I'm hearing on the project I work on, but it's also prevalent in areas where young people maybe are afraid to try weed and THC is kind of like a handier way. I don't want to say handier way, but it's a way yeah, of sure, exploring it. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I, I guess like Margaret spoke about the challenges in regulating a legal market. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's a, that's a whole other conversation to be had about yeah. um, trying to get to grips with potentially an underground illegal Absolutely. market for illicit substances. And being mindful, if you have young people coming into, say, your premises or your school, or in our case, our youth organisation, being mindful of this synthetic THC, if you see a young person with one of those disposable, my advice would be to nearly assume that that's what's in it because you're better off assuming that that's what's in it and then avoiding young people because young people are like see like dropping and having seizures and toilets and You've all. You've seen that in newspapers yeah, recently. Yeah. yeah, but a lot of that is, it can be linked to this. So it's about, I think, maybe assuming that it is and then you're kind of eliminating the risk for yourself rather than hoping that it's not. And just something obviously for schools and parents to be aware of as yeah. well. Um, Susan, so you're actively working with people who have a nicotine addiction. Um, and what type of clients do you see in, in your service? Um, well, at, um, I'm working in Stop Smoking Service and we welcome everybody into the service. Um, so it, it's regardless of age. We have some people that are very young and some people that are uh, older. Um, there's absolutely, you know, uh, no barriers for anybody who wants to come. If anybody's under the age of 18, uh, if they're between 16 and 18, they can refer themselves. But they, we obviously work along with their GP. If they're under 16, obviously we need the parental consent as well as working with the GP. Mm. But I have some clients that are actually in their 80s within the service, which is which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, and never too old to stop. Never too old yeah. to stop. Um, and then on top of that, obviously, some people think this is a cost involved. It's free for all as well, regardless of means, whether you have medical card or non-medical card, which is obviously very important yeah. as well. Um, the, you know, we've all mentioned it here today, nicotine is incredibly addictive. Um, and the problem is an awful lot of people come in with other issues uh, as well as just nicotine addiction um, and they, they need a lot of support outside of that and you know the great thing is that um, as Stop Smoking Advisors we're all trained in MEC which is making every contact count yeah. um, and we would try and you know uh, either if we can't help the person ourselves because obviously we're not counsellors we would refer them on to um, you know other websites or clinics or back to their GP or whatever we signpost them in whatever direction so we have a very holistic non-judgmental approach which is really really important yeah. because we have a service for up to a year with people with behavioral change and people build up a lot of rapport with us so and that's important because it is a huge lifestyle change it is a huge addiction it was mentioned here before uh, earlier on uh, as well that it's actually i think it was Martina earlier on said it's uh, stronger than heroin addiction and, and i can put my hand up and say that's actually true because I'm, i work with people within the addiction services homeless services uh, I have a lot of students within in my clinics as well uh, that have a lot of you know maybe mental health uh, issues. There's a lot of pressures out there for people, mm. and they use nicotine as their crutch. Um, it's it's kind of what they do for the little dopamine release, um, which you know is obviously a very very dangerous thing to do, and it's difficult. So they need the support, and we're here to help. Um, we've done well in recent years in making like conventional tobacco cigarettes unattractive to young people. I think. Mm -hmm. So why are e-cigarettes suddenly so attractive and then obviously addicted, particularly for young people? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, you know, obviously, I've mentioned already nicotine is, is highly addictive. So uh, when uh, nicotine is taken in, whether it's smoked or vaped, it takes seven seconds to get to the brain. And then a dope, uh, the chemical dopamine is released. And so the young person or the, the person that's taking the nicotine actually gets this kind of dopamine, which is kind of your happy hormone mm -hmm. and nice and relaxing. Um, the problem is it only lasts for a couple of seconds, so that's why they want more hits and more hits. So that's that's the, the initial draw. Um, um, but also on top of that, um, it's very much marketed. Uh, uh, vapes are very much marketed towards the young person in that they're flashy to look at, the nice big strong colours. Um, a lot of the girls tell me they get certain ones to match their outfits on the night. Okay. Um, they're also very strongly flavoured. And unfortunately, a lot of um, young people are actually not only do they like the strong flavours as opposed to cigarettes, they're actually substituting uh, the vape for food because they're in a, they want to be in a calorie deficit for weight loss, which is really, really scary. Um, and 
Uh, in addition to that, uh, obviously, it's very, very popular with their friends. It's marketed very strongly. It's cool. Instagram follow, you know, their followers, uh, their influencers. Uh, it's been advertised, which is all very, very dangerous. And a lot of them actually don't realize that there's nicotine in it or how much is in it. I actually had a girl uh, last week um, and uh, we talked about vaping and so she's a smoker as well. Um, and um, she was telling me all about the different colors and flavors and the different, you can get fidget spinners and USB sticks and all these type of things. And then she went on to tell me about her latest crave and a lot of her friends is that uh, she actually can get one with a, a white LED light. So it, it actually, at nighttime, looked really cool um, because nice. it lit up. Um, but then I said to her, so what strength, uh, you know, nicotine are you taking? Okay. And she couldn't answer me. She had absolutely no knowledge. Okay. Um, and I know we were supposed to actually have one of your clients with us yeah. this morning, yeah. um, a college student who has used your service. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, she was unable to be with us, but I know she's given you permission to say a little bit about her journey. Do you want to maybe talk a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, Kira wasn't able to come today, um, but she kindly allowed us to uh, use her, her uh, story and I hope she makes a quick recovery. Um, but Kira, in fifth year in school, um, became addicted to smoking and vaping at the same time, more or less. Um, a lot of it was peer pressure. Um, they, all of her friends were doing it. She was actually working part time in a shop herself and everybody was going in buying these vapes and she was literally surrounded by them um, uh, on a weekend job. Uh, and she decided to try it. And she thought, like most people, that she's not going to get hooked or she'd be in control. Mm. Um, but by sixth year, she said she knew she wasn't in control. Uh, where she was smoking and I was smoking outside the house and hiding it. Um, she was actually bringing the vape to bed, putting it under her pillow, putting it in her bedside locker. Uh, first thing in the morning, before she put her toe out of the bed, she wanted her vape. And she realized it was becoming a big, big issue. Um, and she was getting a little bit contrary and withdrawn when she didn't have it. So she was going and buying one vape and into two vapes a day sometimes. So when she actually went to college, um, she said, I really have to do something about this. Um, but she didn't know if she could. She was very, very scared. So she actually was a friend of hers that got our number. Um, I'm actually quite close to DCU. I'm also in, you mentioned Range Gorman, but I'm also yeah. up in um, uh, the Enhanced Community Care in St. Clair's beside DCU. Um, and uh, she came in to me and she asked, could she, she uh, come to the service? And she was very, very nervous because she thought we'd be judging her um, and that she kind of felt quite weak. Um, and like, we're not, as Stop Smoking Advisors, we're not there to judge anybody, we're there to help. Um, and we liked, as I said already, to you know, have a holistic approach mm. um, to people. So she started with me um, seven weeks ago and she seven weeks uh, quit cigarettes and vapes. Brilliant. We're delighted about it. Yeah. So fingers crossed. Um, and she really wants to get the message out there to anybody that hasn't vaped not to start. Um, but if they have, to just stick with it, particularly to get over that first week because it's, it's easier than she thought and, and you know, not, to, not to be afraid. Yeah, testament to your services well, Susan, mm, thank the, you. The, and all of our services nationally, mm. that they are very, very good and effective. Yeah. Speak of the services, Paul, what do we know at the moment about supporting people to stop vaping? We have very, very good evidence-based stop smoking services, but what do we know specifically of, uh, about stopping vaping? Yeah, well, I, I think it's fair to say, Ed, that that's an area which is evolving. Um, you know, we have a lot of um, experience, we have a lot of research evidence upon which we can build evidence-based stop smoking services. And um, we've done the work to produce a national clinical guideline around stop smoking services. All of that, uh, all the services that we offer, we can stand over, they're robust, we know they work, they're clinically sound. When it comes to e-cigarettes, because this is a new product, we're really only in the very early stages of this. Uh, we don't yet have all of the research studies done um, in terms of what's going to be effective to help people to stop vaping. Uh, so we're, we're, we're in a difficult situation in terms of providing response to that problem. We can, of course, go back to first principles. Mm -hmm. We know that this is a health behaviour. There's ample evidence that there's counselling, psychological kind of support that we can provide to people to help them change different health behaviours, whether it's smoking, whether it's alcohol, whether it's healthy eating, active living. You know, so there's, there's, we, we would think that some of the behavioural support that we use to help people stop smoking is likely to be effective when it comes to helping people stop using e-cigarettes. There's also a question then around uh, using stop smoking medicines to help people stop vaping. So, um, you know, we've, we've mentioned this point already. Um, at its core, for people that are using e-cigarettes, the real challenge is around nicotine addiction. Mm. So we know that we have stop smoking medicines such as nicotine replacement therapy, such as varenicline, uh, that can be effective in helping people with that kind of physical or biological component to their addiction to nicotine. Um, at the moment, those medicines, though, haven't been through a process where they've been studied in the field. 
and uh, they've then been licensed and are marketed as drugs that can help people stop vaping. Um, certainly on a case-by-case -case basis, I would know clinical colleagues who would feel comfortable having a discussion with somebody who's vaping around perhaps trying one of those medicines. But from a, a national perspective, in terms of codifying that into a stopping vaping or stopping e-cigarette use guideline and saying, look, we can use these medicines, we're not at that point at the moment, Ed. Okay. Um, what's our current service offering, Susan? So if somebody comes to see you, I suppose primarily we're speaking about quitting smoking now, but in terms of just treating nicotine addiction, what kind of offerings do our HSC services have? Yeah. Um, well, as I said, it's free for all. So um, anybody that wants to come, they just um, have to contact us. And I'll go through the, the numbers there in a minute. Um, but in addition to that, they get free behavioural support for up to one year, um, which is really, really invaluable. Um, and uh, we also give 12 weeks free combination NRT to anybody with uh, tobacco addiction. Um, so uh, for somebody that are smoking or, or smoking and vaping combined. Um, we also have carbon monoxide monitors in our clinics, which people absolutely love using because they actually can see that their lungs are improving um, and they can see the carbon monoxide reducing if they don't smoke. Um, and as I mentioned already, we you know, are all trained in MEC, making every contact count. So we would look after the person as a whole and hopefully you know, refer them on to other services or help support them with whatever little issue that it was that maybe you know, we have to deal with the, with the other issue as well at some level in order to support them to make sure that they, they do stay quit. And our uh, contact details for the service are, are on a slide uh, on the screen there. You yeah. have a free phone number, our website, uh, our free text as well yeah. um, to contact our services. And we're based uh, nationwide and on quit.ie you'll be able to get all of the uh, clinic information. We might dip into the lucky bag quickly, so and see what comes out. Martina, you've been monitoring some of the uh, audience uh, Q&A. Anything standing out as yeah, being th interesting? Yeah, there's, there's a good few questions and our colleagues are, are responding to the questions in the chat, but uh, just one to pose to the, um, to the audience. So the industry claims that young people who are vaping in Ireland are, are the same people that would have smoked. And so they're not smoking, they're just vaping. Um, so uh, what, what would you say to that? Um, and, and you can decide who, who might, maybe Paul, maybe or something might be, might be the best person <laughs> to respond to that one, Paul. I yeah. see Paul's marketing. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of smiling you, because I think, I, I think the answer, um, uh, Martina, is in, is in the lead in there, which is we're hearing this from the industry. Uh, and I've already made the point that we know that the um, industry behind e-cigarettes is increasingly controlled now by the tobacco industry. They have a playbook. They cause confusion. Uh, they try to debunk, um, you know, health um, officials who are trying to advise people in terms of harm. So um, it, specifically in terms of that point um, around whether or not uh, children and young people who are using e-cigarettes would have anyway uh, been smoking. That, that's not the case. Um, you know, we know that uh, the use of um, cigarettes across children and young people has reduced significantly over the last number of decades and is now at a historic low. We've been very successful in terms of denormalizing the use of e-cigarettes. Um, this is a new product. Um, it's being uh, marketed and promoted in a way that it's very appealing to children and young people. We've heard that. Um, and we know then that when we do research studies, so for example, there was a very big study done in the west of Ireland as part of Planet Youth, which I know some people tuning in may be familiar with in terms of schools and, and, and youth services. And in that, they looked at the use of um, combustible cigarettes uh, and e-cigarettes across children and young people in the west of Ireland. They looked at risks and protective factors. And what they found was that, um, uh, in, in essence, the children who were using e-cigarettes, they did not have the same risk factors as children that were using uh, combustible cigarettes. So, in other words, e-cigarettes are managing to identify a cohort of children who don't inherently have the risk factors to go on and use combustible cigarettes. So definitely, this is a, this is a new problem. And the final point I'd make is, not only is this a new problem, but it's exacerbating the existing challenge of smoking among children and young people. So again, if I go to that Planet Youth study in the west of Ireland, um, but we'll see similar data if we look at the Health Behaviour School Children Survey, we look at SPAD as well. Uh, many children and young people are actually dual using nicotine through combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So I think when it comes to e-cigarettes, children and young people, we have a new problem for children and young people who would not have smoked. And for those children and young people who are unfortunately, despite our best efforts, are smoking, many of them are using e-cigarettes as well. And that's exacerbating the problem. Yeah. The, the, uh, 
uh, one for inside, one for outside film, and I call that um, steady stream of nicotine all day, um, which is unfortunate for, for young people. Anything else, Martina, from the yeah, chat that you'd like to There's another question in there. Um, so what do we think about uh, the stance taken in other countries like Brazil or India to ban e-cigarettes altogether? And equally, um, a different stance that might be taken in the UK and New Zealand in terms of having e-cigarettes as part of the tobacco control um, picture. Would anybody like to take that one? Uh, Margaret, any um, thoughts on outright bans of e-cigarettes or even things like prescription only that we've seen, um, you know, be discussed in other countries? Any um, I'll answer the ban. I'll leave Paul <laughs> to the prescription only piece. Um, I suppose around the enforcement, we do. We always welcome stronger regulations because, as I said at the outset, the regulations that we have are the minimum standards at the moment. And listening to the story here from the youth worker around the exposure to the youth around the colours, like you can see the examples I yeah, have here, the, the common yeah, yeah. <laughs> shapes and sizes and colours, and they are attractive, and the flavours and the smells. So, yeah, we do welcome, if there was legislation to enforce by environmental health, we would rigorously enforce it. But unfortunately, the legislation we're working with at the minute does not um, cover the flavours and the packaging and that. But hopefully, as Paul says, it's an emerging product, an emerging area. So we would welcome if that was uh, down the line for us. So I'll hand Paul over to the yeah, prescription. Yeah, just your, your, your gut reaction, Paul, for yeah. like prescription only, good thing, bad thing. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Ed, I think um, different countries are taking different positions when it comes to e-cigarettes and, and how they regulate. Um, I think in Ireland, um, here we have been slow out of the traps. Uh, we're one of the few um, developed countries that don't currently have um, a ban on the sale of e-cigarettes to children and young people. So I think it's great that we're taking that initial step forward, and I think there are other steps that we need to take. I think the reason that different countries are taking different positions is because the evidence is unfolding around us, and then people need to consider the evidence in conjunction with sort of their values and beliefs around public health. So I think here in Ireland, we have a particular kind of valuing and emphasis on protecting people's health, particularly when it comes to the health of um, children and young people who are vulnerable. Um, and I, I, I think the position that we're t moving towards in Ireland like stacks up well in terms of the evidence around harms and things like that. Um, definitely, um, I, I mentioned it in my talk, in, New in Australia, they um, have had a particular kind of recent history around e-cigarettes. So um, heretofore in Australia, it hasn't been possible to pop into a shop and buy a nicotine containing e-cigarette. That's something that wasn't legal in Australia. And mm. just for context for people, if they're not aware, actually Australia is recognised globally as a leader in the area of tobacco control. They have very, very low smoking prevalence um, in, in, in Australia. Um, now, there, there is this debate, which we examined, and we resolved for Ireland back in 2022 in terms of whether or not e-cigarettes might be helpful in helping people stop smoking. So we've resolved it at that point in time. We will come back and look at that again in the future uh, when we have further evidence. But in terms of um, that question in, in Australia, uh, their view is if there is benefit for people who currently smoke, and only people who currently smoke, around having access to e-cigarettes to help them quit, well, that's better delivered within the country uh, through pharmacies as a medicinal product. And that's the direction that they're going to take in terms of making e-cigarettes, moving from a position where e-cigarettes were not available to actually making them available. So I think that's a very interesting development because it would seem to me to sort of offer the best of both worlds in terms of very definitely you get the protections of children and young people. But in terms of people who currently smoke, there's availability of the product. So I think let's watch that space and let's learn from what they've done. Brilliant. And uh, I, I'm, I'm conscious that we are um, fast approaching 12.30, um, but I might just hop back very quickly to maybe Sean and then to Susan. Sean, just very quickly and off the top of your head as a reaction, um, what advice would you give to someone your age who is listening and is thinking about vaping? What would you say to them? You know what the risks are like. I'm not going to say that just don't do it because it's like it's more complicated than that because there's so many people around that are doing it. But just don't be stupid, I guess. Like, yeah. Just don't be, don't get addicted. Yeah. If you're going to try it, try not to do it as much as possible. But just it's more complicated than just don't do it. So um, an honest reaction, I, I, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. if the audience has gathered anything from some of the discussion and the presentations that have been going on up here today, complicated e-cigarettes <laughs> are at the moment. Um, Susan, what would you say um, to, um, to, to someone who has a nicotine addiction of some shape or form um, 
and, 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 and will answer the question, just a very general take-home message yep. for them. Um, what I'd say is contact us as, as soon as you can. Uh, you're very welcome. We'd absolutely love to help you. Um, so I want, we, you know, the, the Take Back Control campaign, we want to help everybody take back control and get on top of their addiction. So to uh, contact us on the free phone number 1-800-201-203 or to go on quit.ie and just to select which county and clinic and service you want or free text quit to 50100. Thanks very much, Susan. No problem. So I suppose to draw to a close, guys, um, Firstly, thank you very much to Martina and to Paul for their um, presentations this morning. And a big thanks to our panel, to Margaret, to Sean, who unfortunately had to leave school. You can see he's devastated. Um, to Amanda and to Susan, thank you very, very much for being with us this morning. Uh, and thanks very much to the background team here as well. There are other people in the room who you can't see who have been working with us this morning and they've been stellar. Uh, so thanks very much to all the team as well. Um, hot topic at the moment is vaping. Um, even on the train yesterday, uh, there was a table of four people all getting their spoke in, having a conversation about e-cigarettes. Um, but I hope from this morning that we have been able to give you some clear, um, accurate and hopefully unbiased information um, about all things e-cigarettes and vaping that you'll be able to take away with you and put to use in whatever shape or form that you need to do that with. The um, new resources that Martina spoke about this morning um, they are on our Tobacco Free Ireland website now. If you just Google HSE Tobacco Free, that will be the first hit that comes up in Google. Click on the Resources tab and you'll see e-cigarettes in there and all of the new resources are, are, are located there. There will be a small print run on some of them as well for health professionals, which will be available on healthpromotion.ie. But for now, to you, the audience, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, take care. Have a good day. We'll talk to you soon.